my name is Sherry Hardage, and um, I was a docent for the Coronado Historic Site for about three years until COVID happened, and we haven't been able to go back out there and be docents again. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Matt. Uh, Matt Barber is the uh, manager at the Coronado Historic Site. I think we ought to start, if we're going to talk about trade, we'll start with um, human migration into the Americas. Uh, people began to come into the new world uh, as early as 30,000 years ago. I thought, although I think many people think that's a bit early. Uh, there were two or three different routes, as you can see on this uh, slideshow, if you can see my cursor, uh, the ice sheets in Canada opened up uh, sometimes uh, 20, 40 miles wide and people were able to come down uh, through the land uh, in that area. And then also, there was a boating culture which developed somewhat later, but not too much later. And people were able to just follow the coast and stop every now and then and, uh, and, and live for a while. They called it um, a kind of a, a walking migration where people uh, uh, went somewhere, found a nice place to live, lived for maybe a couple of generations and then uh, continued moving on down. So if you were already a boating culture and you made your living in on the ocean and collecting uh, marine uh, foods, uh, it would be a piece of cake probably to get in your boat and go on down the coast a little further if it got really cold or if uh, some of the other people in the area were pushing you to, to move on. So it is possible that people reached South America in the er areas of Peru and Chile uh, as, as early as 20,000 years ago. So uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of questions about that and people are still studying that a lot. The earliest trade in North America that we're absolutely sure about is the uh, Clovis points uh, and the, uh, the various, uh, what they call darts. Uh, this, this point right here was on a spear and it is called a dart. Uh, this particular piece is, uh, I believe, chert. Uh, and the, the Clovis points were made from a number of rocks all of which could be sharpened and pointed uh, and kind of carved like this. And the uh, raw materials for these part, these uh, points were things that people would trade with other people. So the Hamus, for instance, was a source of obsidian and it, very early on. And people would take chunks of obsidian with them and trade it for perhaps jerky, buffalo jerky with some of the Plains tribes, perhaps. And, uh, and we know this because especially with obsidian, you can test its, um, its chemical structure and you can see where it came from because they've uh, analyzed the chemical structure of various sites where they know obsidian was mined. And that is true also in Mexico. So here's Mesoamerica. This is what we're gonna be talking about today. This is the area of the world where corn was domesticated. Uh, this shows uh, some of the major cultural areas uh, the Mayans were in the peninsula, the Yucatan Peninsula. Oaxaca and Guerrero are where Teosinte originally uh, was. That's the earliest forms of corn. And so they were uh, domesticated there. Uh, the central area right here is where Mexico City is in the Valley of Mexico. West over here is um, uh, put the Purépecha people much later on but this is the area where lots of avocados grow today. And it is um, uh, Michoacan, the state of Michoacan. And the uh, area of Pátzcuaro is uh, right over there in, that, in this area too. And north up here are other states like Chihuahua and uh, 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 Sinaloa and some of the other states that, that border on the ocean. And uh, that is also where uh, corn found its way and where corn grows quite well. And so corn was a major export item from uh, central, from the Mesoamerican areas. And also it changed the culture entirely. Mesoamerican markets, for instance, uh, the new world is home to lots of different vegetables and things that we sort of take for granted now. But the Spaniards, when they arrived, the chroniclers were so amazed at the variety of fruits and vegetables that were there and things to eat. And in many cases, they were afraid of them because they looked so weird. For instance, this uh, 
weird looking thing here is a, uh, a papausa. And this uh, orangey thing down here is a, a sapote, a meme sapote. Or, so um, yeah, uh, if you'd never seen anything like that, you might be a little bit leery of eating it. <laughs> um, all kinds of things that we take for granted, like avocados and artichokes, are new world, uh, new world foods. We know that chocolate is, most of us know that. Beans and corn, of course, are from the new world. But the sweet potato uh, was in North America, and the white potato that we're mostly used to, the Idaho potato, is actually from South America. So I'm just talking here about the stuff from, from Central America and North America. Um, the marigold is a very famous flower. It's a, a, the Day of the Dead flower that's used in uh, Mexican uh, celebrations. And also it was a flower that the Aztecs used when they worshiped their ancestors as well. Uh, also cotton was, uh, was uh, here in the, in the New World. It was a, a kind of cotton that grows only here or grew only here. Uh, all the pumpkins and squashes that we're familiar with were here. And uh, chili peppers, uh, walnuts, choke cherries, blackberries, and even strawberries were new world plants. They were not uh, old world brought here. So the interesting thing about, um, about the new world and its civilizations was the fact that we had maize, we had corn. Uh, corn was, is an old world word and it was referencing um, like barley and things like that, those kinds of grains. But uh, in the New World, it was maize. And uh, civilization would not have been possible without the cultivation of maize and a method of turning it into a digestible form. So they, what the people would do is they would soak the corn, uh, especially the teosinte, which is the, the uh, very early corn, had a very hard uh, outer surface. And so it needed to be soaked to, um, to soften that surface and make it grindable. Uh, so they would soak it in water, but they discovered that if you soaked it in some kind of a ash or limestone water, uh, it was easier to work with and didn't take as long to become soft. Uh, the ancestral seed grinder, which uh, it, if you uh, have uh, any experience with the Paleolithic people, uh, they often had a little stone with a hole in it and they would grind in the hole. And that evolved into this, which is a matate. And then the handheld rock is a mano. So the manos and matates were used to grind wet corn more often than they were to, to grind dry corn. And the gooey mass uh, became something that they could use like, a, like dough and they could make tamales. And that's how tamales were invented. The, the uh, term of uh, putting something uh, lime-like lime is, um, is called nixtamalization. You've probably heard that term because most of you are familiar with, uh, with the culture here in New Mexico. Um, it became a, a staple because uh, that corn that was soaked in an alkaline solution could break down the aflatoxins. Uh, the mycotoxin contamination is sometimes makes hard uh, corn hard to digest. And so it has a better odor and an improved flavor and it got to be quite popular. Where uh, it was further domesticated into 32 distinct varieties. Uh, by 200 BC, corn had spread over the breadth of North and South America. And uh, it, was, uh, it was domesticated in a number of places. Uh, some places uh, liked a particular color, so they uh, bred corn for that color, and some uh, liked a particular flavor. Um, popcorn was the old teosinte that had uh, that kept its tough exterior, so when you heat it up sufficiently, that it explodes, and uh, that's how popcorn uh, was was very popular too. And that was a particular type of corn that was uh, traded. So with um, with these, uh, with corn as a as a as a grain, I don't know if you've ever read the book um, Guns, Germs, and Steel, but in that book it describes how every civilization on the planet that's gotten big enough to actually build buildings and have a government and religion and all that sort of stuff, um, every one of them had some kind of a grain that was the basis of its economy, 
and the grains allowed enough people to be fed that you could spare some people. And when you can spare people, then you can have politicians. I'm not sure we really want to spare that many people these days, but who knows? Um, when we have a consistent food source and reliable crops, you can form much larger communities. And so between 1200 and 900 BC, uh, people in Mexico were building earthen mounds and pyramids and they created sculptures. This sculpture is from Teotihuacan, which dates to around, uh, I think it's uh, the, the year zero. Um, the first, so the, so the Olmecs were the first uh, culture that began in, um, in Mexico, and they were called a pristine culture. And the reason that they were called that is because they grew from nothing. They were not influenced by any previous culture. They were the very first culture. And they were known for uh, these colossal heads, which you recognize. And the area where they developed was this part of Mexico. You can see in the little pocket slide down here um, that it's a, it's a fairly small area, but uh, they were able to grow enough corn to, to begin to uh, coalesce into civilization. Um, they codified a number of their beliefs. Um, they established a culture of uh, priests and ruling classes. And the name Olmecs was not their name for themselves. That's a name that the Aztecs gave them and it means the rubber people. So what they, what they were famous for and what they uh, had as a trade good was rubber balls and things made of rubber. And the, uh, the rubber balls were uh, from, the, um, from a tree that gives a, uh, well, let's see, what do, you, what do you call it? It gives a kind of a goo. And then there was a, a vine nearby, a moonflower vine, which had some chemicals that when you mixed it with that goo, you got rubber. So they invented that and then they were famous for that. They started um, making rubber balls for games and that was the very beginning of the very famous uh, Mesoamerican ball game. The earliest cache of rubber balls was found around 1600 BC. Uh, it's predating the earliest known ball court by over 200 years. Okay, so this picture is, um, is the ball court in Tonina, which is uh, in, in the uh, Chiapas region of Mexico. And Tonina is uh, the largest or the tallest pyramid in Mexico. And this is a really beautiful ball court. Uh, they've uh, reconstructed it, but it is basically shaped like an eye. So you can see the middle section here is the leg of the eye or the middle section of the eye. And then the uh, lengthwise plazas on either side uh, form the top and the bottom of a capital I. And so this, um, uh, this shape, is, uh, is very similar to the shape of a turtle's shell, the pattern on a turtle shell. And um, so years ago, I wrote to a friend of mine who was an archeologist and, and I asked him a simple question. I said, um, when, um, uh, when this ball game was played and someone was beheaded afterwards, was it the winner or the loser that was, that was sacrificed? And he wrote me back. And the first thing he said was, never ask an archaeologist a simple question. What I got was a four page document talking about the, how the hero twins created humanity, how this was uh, uh, the rain god Chalk's lightning bolt had hit the cosmic turtle and had cracked its shell open. And here we have a crack in the shell. That's what this entire ball court represents. And the players. Um, were often captives from ruling families from rival cities. So uh, they got beheaded. Uh, sometimes all of them got beheaded because that was what they were playing the game for. And they wanted, in theory, they wanted to be sacrificed to the gods. I'm not sure how much of that was, uh, was political, uh, for, politically forced on them because they'd gotten captured or if it was uh, uh, a, a strictly religious uh, uh, endeavor. Okay, in this ball court at Tony Na, the goalpost is actually a captive uh, kneeling down and ready to have his head cut off. So that's what you were aiming at with your ball. Uh, the, the ball game was also played with these 
same rubber balls that the uh, Olmecs had invented. And the um, uh, the only way to hit the ball, they're, they're, they're rubber, so they're bouncy, but they weren't that bouncy and they were very heavy and very hard. So the players wore a stone uh, around their waist with, um, uh, with a belt to hold it on. And they would hit the ball with their hip, with this stone on their hip. And uh, then they would try to hit the, the head or the goalpost in some place. And uh, I'm not sure how it was scored. Nobody plays that game anymore, so we don't really know. But um, uh, this was definitely what they were aiming at. And I'm sure as they were playing the game, they knew they would eventually, uh, in that day, be in that position. And that's a that's kind of creepy. <laughs> Okay, so the Olmecs were the first people in the Americas to develop a system of writing, which was called the Isthmian script. And they also invented numbers and they invented the concept of zero and they had a base 20 numbering system. And they standardized uh, their trading system with uh, basket volumes uh, so that they could track how much uh, grain, you know, how, how much in weight uh, of grain that they uh, traded or beans or or squash or whatever. So so what's important, this is probably the most important slide in this whole slideshow because what it what it indicates is that once trade got to the point where a civilization could uh, could develop writing and uh, and mathematics to keep track of the trade where the trade had gotten so big, and was uh, such a powerful thing and certain powerful people were in control of it and benefited from it, uh, they needed to have a system to, to keep track of it. And a, a, a civilization is not a true civilization unless it has arithmetic, math of some kind, and uh, writing. Uh, in this case, it's glyph writing. Many of the glyphs also uh, had sounds to them. So you could put the glyphs together and make a sound of a word. Um, it's a very interesting system. I, I wish I knew more about it, but I don't. But this was, this was the indicator to all that the Olmecs were a true civilization in the Americas. And they were extremely influential. Um, they they uh, were the influencers of the Mayans who then influenced the Aztecs and the Purépecha people. And it was uh, just comes down through history, all the, the things that they started, the Olmec started, that continued on down uh, through time. Okay, so this was the Olmec's basic empire after about 800 years. Uh, they, they were in, uh, in power for 800 years. Um, I'm not positive why the Olmecs uh, fell apart, but as they were falling, falling apart, the, um, the uh, Teotihuacan people um, uh, gained prominence. And so they were in central Mexico, near Mexico City. We'll get to them in a minute. Okay, so this is Teotihuacan. It's uh, near Mexico City. And this is, um, uh, for a very long time when I was growing up and heard about it, um, it didn't sound like anybody knew who they had been. Uh, that they were a mysterious uh, group of people that just appeared out of nowhere and, and had this huge civilization and very influential, and then they just disappeared. But uh, the truth is that the full length of the 20th century has been spent studying the Teotihuacan uh, phenomenon, and, and essentially it sounds like they were um, very metropolitan. Uh, for instance, uh, they might have had... Uh, different people there uh, that had come from different areas. They traded all over Mexico and um, they rose to prominence based on their ability to produce large surpluses of agricultural products because they used uh, irrigation. They were the first ones to pretty much invent and use it regularly. They also invented the Chinampa, which is a, uh, an island form of agriculture that is uh, stakes driven into a, a shallow lake and then filled with dirt and uh, rocks and things and made it, made into a uh, garden. And then they continue to, uh, to grow food on top, on top of that and build, build the soil up. The, the products of this uh, culture were uh, art and music, um, uh, plays and poetry, um, all kinds of things. They, they built this city specifically to look like 
the universe as they saw the universe. So this is the pyramid of the sun as seen from the pyramid of the moon. And uh, there was a, also a, a plumed serpent tempet, temple. There are all kinds of uh, interesting temples. Each one uh, portrays a certain aspect of the cosmos. And in about, I think it was 2003 or four, uh, a, there was a big flood and, uh, and part of this central area, this, the, the area here with the, uh, where you'd have parades and things like that, uh, it just fell in. And it turns out there was a, a tunnel underneath it. And the investigations into the tunnel um, have shown uh, remnants of sacrifices, uh, stored goods, um, sculptures of gods. And also if you're there and you turn the lights out and it's night, you can see glowing stars. They have, they have, they actually put uh, various uh, mica and uh, mercury and some other um, elements into the walls. And when you're in this dark tunnel, you're in the part of the underworld where people came from and you can you can be it's like you're surrounded by stars so that's a that's an aspect of the tunnel that people hadn't really understood and they've been uh, studying the tunnels i've i've read up some on it but i don't know a whole lot teotihuacan had its emphasis on political and economic power and not so much in uh, cultivating intellectual pursuits um, they used the math of the of the olmecs and they used the um, the glyph system of the Olmecs, they did uh, evolve it quite a bit. Uh, they were mostly very well known for their uh, luxury goods, paintings and jade carvings. This is uh, jade here and, uh, and other kinds of sculptures. This is a photogra uh, photograph of a, a artist rendering of when Teotihuacan was painted. And uh, we'll get to how they painted it in a little bit. Uh, pigments were a big trade item throughout the, the Americas too, because people like to have different colors on their buildings and different colors in their clothes. Uh, so this is a, a beautiful picture of the Pyramid of the Sun with all of the different pyramids that uh, line the causeway there. This was their, their uh, sphere of influence uh, during the time that they were uh, in business. They, there were trade routes uh, linking Teotihuacan to all kinds of, of uh, raw materials. Um, there was uh, trade routes going to obsidian quarries in Pachuca and to the cocoa uh, bean groves uh, near the Gulf of Mexico. Cotton came in from the Pacific coast and ceramics came from Veracruz. Uh, there's a number of scholars uh, like David Carballo of Boston University uh, has revealed the sheer diversity of the citizenry of Teotihuacan. They, judging just from the artifacts and paintings found inside surviving structures, residents came to Teotihuacan from as far afield as Chiapas and Yucatan, which is way over here. Um, they also, uh, they all, the town, also the city, had probably uh, Mayan neighborhoods and Zapotec neighborhoods, much like uh, New York City has, you know, Chinatown and uh, and other uh, ethnic areas. One of the things that was widely copied by the Teotihuacan architects was this um, uh, talud tablero, which is a slope and flat top staircase. Uh, you'll notice it looks a little familiar. Here's uh, one from Palenque, was made several, many hundreds of years later, probably 500 years later. And it's a, it's a modification of the uh, talud tablero staircase. This is at Chichen Itza. This is a detail of uh, what just a piece of a building looked like while in Teotihuacan. They, they had uh, all kinds of wonderful fantasy sculptures, um, uh, animals, uh, some people. Uh, they didn't seem to elevate people into a, a position of power or ruling families, that sort of thing. They, uh, some archaeologists think they may have been a little bit more uh, egalitarian, not quite so uh, uh, ruled by one family, but it might also have been a number of families that uh, got together and, and ruled as a group. So let's go back to talking about the painting of the buildings. Um, buildings in 
the uh, Olmec and Teotihuacan cities were highly decorated with bright colors, and so did the subsequent uh, uh, cultures. The Mayans especially uh, painted most of their buildings red, and they even sometimes painted the plaza in a red. And how did they get the red? We'll talk about that in a second. There's a place in Bonampak. Uh, it's a, a very small little building. And you can go inside and here is this beautiful mural, uh, extremely well preserved. It's uh, almost a thousand years old. And that blue color and the green color are the original paints. And the blue is an, an indigo uh, from a plant that was mixed with a clay paligorskite. And that was one of the Mayans more impressive technological achievements, at least in chemistry, was this uh, beautiful color. And they, ex they exported that color um, it was quite expensive and they got the reds and the purple dyes uh, for the indigo plant uh, allowed them to uh, make the, the bluish color uh, that was in that paint. And then they also is a tiny little cochineal bug. It's about the size of a tick. And if you squish it, it just pops and it's like it just bled. It just bleeds. It's just an in, incredibly intense red color in that little tiny bug. Uh, another source of red color was hematite and cinnabar. Uh, these were used in mortuary practices. Uh, they were often spread on bodies after death. However, in uh, the area around Querétaro, uh, which is more central uh, Mexico, uh, they have actually found bodies where if they break the bone open or cut the bone open, the red is inside the bone. It's actually in the matrix of the bone. And cinnabar is a, um, a form of uh, mercury. So, so people were mining this, uh, the cinnabar and the hematite. And um, the cinnabar had this mercury in it. So people were, were getting it, breathing it, and possibly getting it into their bodies as they mined it. But the worst part was that the paints that they made were, were cinnabar mixed with a, a kind of clay. And they used it like plaster it was painted on. Uh, the outsides of buildings. Well, of course, when it rains, some of that is going to dissolve a little and run out down streams and down uh, waterways and end up in the fields. So apparently, uh, people where a lot of this cinnabar was used, uh, they were poisoned by the cinnabar. So this is a, a deadly form of trade. I don't think they ever made the connection uh, that that cinnabar was causing the problem because they also like to spread it on, over the bones uh, as a ritual later for, for various uh, post-death uh, ceremonies. One of the wide-ranging uh, uh, fun things to do or uh, rituals was the ball game. And a lot of people uh, played the ball game for, for fun and trained and learned how to play it. Uh, I guess it was only really deadly when it was the, the final, uh, final match, so to speak. Um, the uh, the rubber balls were made in the area of Veracruz. And during the Aztec Empire, the lowland states, those Veracruz uh, areas, sent 16,000 rubber balls to Tenochtitlan every single year. Um, so now we're coming up on the Aztec area. Um, the Aztecs uh, traded, and they traded for cocoa beans. And they used cocoa beans like money. Uh, one of this is. This came from uh, a museum in Chiapas. So I'm going to uh, say that is, there's a possibility that this was sort of made up for the tourists. Um, cocoa beans were used like money, supposedly. A man's labor was 100 beans. A goose cost more than a man's labor day. And the services of a public woman was only 20 beans. So it sounds, uh, sounds a little made up to me, but who knows? Uh, the, the truth, though, is that millions of beans were collected as tribute. The Mayans uh, let's, followed Teotihuacan, and they were uh, within 200 years of the fall of Teotihuacan. They uh, rose to prominence based um, on, on the uh, socialization, the, the, um, uh, the information, the uh, the calendar, the writing, the system of math, everything that had started with the uh, Olmecs and had been adopted by Teotihuacan 
was used by the Mayans also, only they expanded down into Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. And, and they were a boating culture and they had uh, canoes. They went all the way around uh, and they traded all the way around uh, into Honduras on both sides of, of the ocean, both the Gulf and the Pacific Ocean. And uh, they also, uh, there's some evidence that they came up into North America as well uh, with, with their trading, uh, trading activities. There, there's a thing called consecutive trading, and that is where, uh, where an item, uh, let's say a sculpture or perhaps a, a large, uh, uh, large container of something uh, would be traded uh, uh, with in a consecutive way. So a trader from the Mayans would go to up, up the coast, for instance, uh, to uh, Tampico and trade there with someone. And then that person might trade that same item further north. And the reason for the, the consecutive trading is because traders probably knew a bunch of languages they'd have to in order to be successful, but they wouldn't know all the languages. So if they would trade only as far away as they knew the language, then that person could take the item and trade it further away based on the languages that he or she knew. Uh, trade was easier if both parties, of course, spoke the same language. It's sort of hard to imagine trading stuff without money. It's hard for us to imagine putting a, a value on something. So uh, a lot of these, uh, these civilizations standardized baskets and, and boxes and different things that, that held a certain amount of stuff, but they had to basically uh, put a price tag on it based on how many man hours it took or how long it took a person to do it. So clearly a sculpture would have taken a very long time to make. And so a sculptor would have, sculpture and jewelry and things like that uh, would have been a higher value. And, so, and they were also a little smaller so they'd be easier to, to take around. Um, and so that's pretty much what, what, what got traded. Food probably didn't get traded as much unless it was a, a, a live animal, for instance. We'll, we'll get to turkeys and things like that in a minute. Prior to 1500 BC, people in what is now the American Southwest were basket making and hunter gatherers. And they were sometimes exposed through the proximity and trade with a growing population of farmers to the South. So the, the corn trade was moving up the coast, but in Mexico, it, uh, in the Mayan world, it was city-states, and it was uh, it was very advanced. Um, that, but their influence was going up, up and down, both uh, to the south and to the north. Uh, the Mayans were probably the most widespread of all the um, Mexican civilizations. Okay, so this is uh, North America and some of Mexico, and you can see uh, the kinds of trade routes that had developed. There were big areas like Zuni and Pecos. These are in where, that we're familiar with in Taos. Um, Taos was a big trading area with the Plains Indians. And then Pecos was uh, Plains and also people from Mexico. So you can see how uh, people from Mexico could to do this co uh, consecutive trading. Uh, articles would come up to New Mexico and be traded around. Um, Chaco Canyon had, had things too. We'll get to that in a little bit that had come directly from Mexico or at least were uh, influenced by, me by Mexico. So the uh, Mugion and the Hohokam people brought Mexican products like ground cocoa and allspice, um, macaws, macaw feathers, shell jewelry, and whole shells up from the seacoast uh, into New Mexico, Arizona, into the uh, inner provinces where there wasn't any ocean, of course. And this is pretty much what our um, our world would look like um, around the time of the Mayans and, and after the Mayans. Um, so the Mugion people were down way down into Chihuahua. Uh, they were farmers and uh, the Gila cliff dwellings is part of that culture. Um, the Hohokam are in uh, Arizona and uh, the uh, Chaco Canyon influence uh, was, was the big white area there. And it was and also influence. That's all around uh, 1000 to 1200 uh, AD. 
So the Pueblo people this far north uh, didn't have, they didn't paint the outsides of their buildings colors, but they did like to paint the insides. And they painted kivas and they often painted inside their homes. And so uh, they didn't require the kinds of pigments like hematite and cinnabar, uh, but they did like the really vivid colors. And for vivid colors, they imported macaw feathers. Uh, this is a uh, dance sash that was made from a macaw and squirrel skin, uh, and it came from Blanding, Utah. It's 850 years old. And these are some, uh, some glyphs uh, of uh, Pueblo people, Membrace and ancestral Puebloans, uh, depicting the art. And this, uh, this lady here uh, that's holding the, the two macaws on either side and has the lightning bolts coming out of her bowl, the bowl on her head, um, she is very similar to the uh, paintings that we see inside the kiva. She's wearing a, a dress with, the, uh, with one shoulder uh, tied up and uh, she's got her rain sash on and then she's holding these two macaws. The, uh, the people in New Mexico um, did have live macaws too. They traded a lot of feathers, but occasionally they would get a, um, a live bird. And we know that because Arroyo Hondo, uh, the ruin at Arroyo Hondo, had a macaw sacrifice. Uh, it was a fairly young bird, but it's clear that the bird had been there for a while and had, uh, had grown there. So at, in some fashion, the people, the Pueblo people, uh, figured out how to keep a bird like that warm enough in the, in the wintertime to make it through the winter. And uh, so they... Uh, they used the feathers. We don't know why the bird was sacrificed. I'm sure its feathers were used then after that, but um, uh, it must have been a very important sacrifice because I'm sure those birds were expensive. This is a, a, a trading village in Chihuahua, northern Chihuahua. Uh, some of us, some of the docents went there uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, this is a, a plaza with macaw pins and cages. They also uh, uh, had turkeys. And this is a uh, part of the breeding operations as well. It's just another uh, view. And, and, the, uh, and I wanted to talk about the turkeys. When Mary Wiaki was uh, giving her talk on uh, turkey feather blankets a couple of weeks ago, uh, she talked about the turkeys that the people kept at the Pueblos was a different species than the wild turkeys. Uh, the wild turkeys around here are the Merriam and Rio Grande subspecies, and they can easily fly away. But the Mexican turkeys that were brought up from Mexico as either eggs or chicks or, or grown birds, uh, they, were, they had been bred long enough that they could no longer fly. And the interesting thing about their feathers is that they were golden. And the Mayans and the uh, Aztecs um, adored the golden feathers. So uh, that's one of the reasons why the turkeys themselves were traded as well as the macaws. And they were also raised at Pakime uh, in the same, uh, in the same uh, way. The wild bird, the Miriam bird, has a little white uh, tip on the end of it. And so the Miriam was also hunted, but they weren't kept as, um, as a domesticated animal. And the uh, little white tip, uh, Mary said, would, would be woven into the blanket to create a design so that you didn't just have a brown or a golden turkey feather blanket. You had this uh, wonderful little design going through it of white feathers. These are the uh, subspecies areas. This is a today, today's range, but the, um, the Meliagris gallo pavo is the, uh, the scientific name for the species that is was domesticated and made into the, the commercial turkey, which has now got lots of different um, uh, breeds of it, but uh, basically it's, it's all the same species. And they were uh, domesticated in Northern Mexico. And now in the Hohokam areas of uh, Arizona, there's uh, evidence that the Hohokam people also domesticated uh, that turkey. Uh, it started out probably with one of the oscillated turkeys in Mexico because they do have beautiful golden feathers and, uh, and worked its way up into uh, northern Mexico and was, was part of a you know, commercial breeding operation. So they were pretty sophisticated people with, uh, with how they uh, bred animals and, and traded the eggs and 
uh, in the feathers. The Pakime potters also uh, made these uh, effigy pots, which they traded, and they they were the precursors to the mean brace potters. So if you look uh, at them, they're they're very amusing, and uh, they have a lot in common with the mean brace uh, uh, designs that uh, that were are so popular right now. So one of the last things I wanted to talk about about major trade items was caca, which is the uh, Mayan word for chocolate, the, the cocoa bean. There was an investigation in uh, Chaco Canyon, I think it was room 26 or 27, where a number of pottery sherds were found. Uh, they, they were broken cups and the cups were uh, cylindrical cups that were very similar to the Mayan cups that they used for uh, ritual drinking of chocolate. And if you look here, um, this the Mayan is on the right and the Chaco and jar is on the left. And uh, uh, if you if you can read the glyphs, the uh, Mayan jar actually says this is for cocoa. It has it has a label on it. And uh, the uh, Chaco and jar is just got a design doesn't say specifically for cocoa, but the design is uh, the same and very similar. And one of the reasons is that the way you drink cocoa, it's a. Uh, not something we do here. We mix uh, cocoa powder with milk and sugar and make a drink out of it. The way they did it was they used hot water and they uh, mixed the cocoa with the hot water and then they frothed it using a, a little aerated stick that's called a batate. And they would move this stick up and down and like, um, like foam it, it, almost like whipping it. And then you ate the foam, you scooped the foam off and ate that. And uh, and it is it's very heady. Um, it's uh, you, you get a buzz off it really quick. And the shape of the jar is has to be very tall and slim or that foam doesn't develop properly. Uh, another way they would do the uh, develop the foam is to take a jar of the chocolate and pour it from a very high distance, you know, maybe four or five feet in the air and pour it down into the uh, the receiving cup and a foam would uh, start that way, too. Um, I think the batate, though, is probably more efficient because that's what you see in Mexico way more than you see the, uh, uh, the method of just pouring it from cup to cup. So here is the Mayan god of chocolate from Tony Na. Um, <laughs> uh, he, he looks very satiated and he has a plant growing out of his ear. He's, uh, he's just uh, high, actually. He's got a a crown of cocoa beans and he's got big cocoa beans uh, hanging on his body. And uh, I, I wish I knew his name. I never did find out. They didn't say in Mexico if, what his uh, specific name was. They may not have known it, uh, but this is uh, this was a, a wonderful sculpture of the choco uh, chocolate god. So the takeaway from this talk, I hope, is that uh, uh, when you have surplus goods and raw materials, uh, you can trade them. And you can do that even if you don't have a civilization. So trade came way before anything else. And they've been part of the human experience for forever, but at least 15,000 years in the new world. Uh, trade allowed people to exchange ideas and technologies that improved their quality of life and health. Because uh, when you're trading with someone, you're not killing them. And you can uh, have, have a meal with them and exchange some ideas. Uh, the development and subsequent trade of a staple grain, in, in our case, in the New World, it's corn, allowed farming uh, settlements to develop. And uh, the, the more, the closer people were together, the more food was available, then they were able to have a, a greater economic security. They also had to be able to store it properly and not lose it to um, animals or, or bad weather. Um, and trade goods could also be used to trade for food in the event that your crops failed. So it was kind of a, uh, it was a, an added security blanket to, um, to survival in a day, a day and age when it was pretty hard to survive. Uh, the rise of religious and ruling classes could only have happened when there was a surplus of food and wealth in order to support intellectual people. Uh, trade enabled large city states to engage in war and conquest. Of course it did. Religion, culture, and artistic forms spread rapidly throughout the region. And as trade increased, the need to keep track of goods forced leaders to invent or adopt systems of writing and mathematics. These in turn enable the rise in artistic, commercial, and scientific endeavors, 
theater, poetry, lifelike sculptures and masks, written historical records, trading, tracking celestial bodies in the heavens, and widespread communication with spy networks and accurate agricultural calendars. Now, the Teotihuacan people, uh, had they used uh, uh, a group of traders. Uh, they paid them extra for, uh, for information about uh, other, other city-states, uh, and they used them as a spy network. So even that uh, is dependent on trade. So the upshot is really that uh, trade came first. And because as you trade more and are more successful, you have to invent things. Uh, to help you in that endeavor. And, uh, and from all of that arises um, a civilization like we have where very few people are actually engaged in agriculture. And uh, we're all engaged in something other than agriculture that supports an, an extremely uh, complex uh, society and economic system. So that's the end, except not really. <laughs> Trade is uh, complex and much is, uh, and so much is known about who traded with whom and what goods they traded. This was really a brisk overview of Mesoamerican influence across the Americas. And in fact, uh, much of the 20th century, archeologists have been studying uh, the middle part of the United States and, uh, and the Southeastern uh, areas around uh, Florida and Georgia. And they've discovered that the, the Mayans and, uh, and various other city states had an influence on, uh, on th those cultures as well. In fact, Cahokia is the mound builder culture and the mounds are very much shaped like pyramids. They, they have a similar slope and they have similar uses. And those mounds date back as early as 3000, uh, 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 BC. So uh, that's the subject of another long talk, which I may put together someday. So I thank you. If you'd like to ask a question, please do just to unmute yourself. Matt, do you want to correct me on anything? I mean, so, some of the things you said are probably open a little bit to interpretation, but no, I think it's a great first step for anyone wanting to discover more. And I think you, you said that. The only typo I saw that I'll, you know, just as a, a caveat, quick caveat, Good. Um, the one that, that occurred to me, and I apologize, you know, I'm still trying to wrap up stuff before I head back. Uh, Pocky may probably post-states members. So you had those reversed. And oh, I don't really? know if that was just okay. a, a flip in the, the mental switch. So members came, uh, and, and, and now mind you, if you go back to DePeso's work, he actually wanted to sell um, uh, Pocky may as earlier but more of the more recent evidence, so the, the evidence that's come out since DePeso published his, his seminal works on Pocky Mang, uh, suggests that it all, almost all of it post-AIDS members. Um, oh, really? Okay. So yeah, when were the membranes? Pocky May was 1,200 to, to about... Well, yeah. so Pocky May is probably, if you actually, you know, if people who've looked at the data since then, Pocky May is probably post-1,300 in most cases, or at least post-1,200. Oh, really? Um, members, classic members, you're looking at um, the 11th and, and 12th centuries. So you're okay. looking at that period just right before that. But I think it's still, I mean, from what I gather, and, and certainly even, even though I, I spend a lot of time down in that region, my focus is not on that time period. Uh, my understanding is there's still a lot of people debating a lot of how members impacted Pocky May and and that kind of stuff. So that was the that was the the one thing I I caught myself. But I think I I'll be honest. Um, I think this is an excellent presentation for people wanting to get a, a a foot in on understanding Mesoamerican cultures. In fact, I thought it was wonderful. I thought the slides were 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 fantastic, and um, I was interested to see such a strong influence in your own talking about the Chiapas region which is not an area which many people in, in America tend to think of, but it's a wonderful region in Mexico. Yes. Um, and it's an area that deserves a lot more, I, me personally, I believe it deserves a lot more um, emphasis of people talking about it. So I thought that was very refreshing. Oh, good, thank you. That's, that's where I lived for six months. So it, it is one wow. of my favorite areas, yeah. Um, Sherry, this may be a sure. dumb question, but did, were there people that had nothing to trade? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know. Well, sure. I mean, subsistence farmers might not have a thing to trade. 
except their labor. And they yeah. might trade their labor for, for food to feed their families. I, I, I would assume like very, very poor people all over the world, they basically trade their labor for a pittance just because they have no choice. This was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, good. Much. I couldn't see any reaction. So I'm like, I, oh. I don't know. <laughs> it's weird. I never gave a talk to a blank screen before. It's very strange. <laughs> um, but I, and I missed this and I apologize. Do, um, do you have dates for the, um, the Teotihuacan um, c- civilization? When was yes. it? Yes, yes. I didn't really refer to my notes all that much, but yes. Um, hmm. It was between AD 150 and 300 that it grew really rapidly. Thank and then it, then it went on it, uh, for about 500 years. So it probably went up to about 500 AD. And Thank then you. the uh, the Mayans uh, were already started. You know, they they were kind of contemporaries early on. And then the Mayan civilization pretty much cl- collapsed by 800. Some of them some of them lived a little bit longer because they were kind of in the outskirts, so they weren't affected by all the wars. There was a lot of wars going on too at that time among Mayan city states. Um, if you were, I'm fascinated with the Olmecs. Mm-hmm. Me too. In, is it, uh, why don't we put together a little excursion? To, is there anything to see? Yes, it, yes. That one, that one picture that showed uh, where the Olmecs started. Yes. There were four or five sites in that area. It's uh, it's close to Veracruz. It's north of Chiapas, and uh, and I I just didn't get over there when I was down there. But that was that was on my list to go and explore the Olmecs. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You, you mentioned something about mycotoxins in uh-huh. the food. Can you, you go over that again? I, I think I missed what that was. Um, well, it's, it's the, on the maze. It, yeah, it, it breaks down aflatoxins from mycotoxin contamination. So there apparently were, were organisms that, uh, or that were in the in the corn naturally or else were grew in the corn is would be my guess I don't really know too much about it some of this stuff I just thought was interesting and tossed it in there but I didn't go very deeply to fully understand it mycotoxins are carcinogenic that's why I was and they're controlled uh in the U.S. I mean there's limits the food and drug administration sets for all sorts of products that's right why but, but don't they aren't they created from a bacteria they create naturally. Yeah, they're not yeah, anything right. added by. So I think that's what I think that's what the nixtamalization prevented. Okay. Thank you. Any any other questions? Comments? Very. It was very educational. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, uh, I appreciate your coming on such a beautiful afternoon, and uh, and it made me feel really good to, that there were so many people who were interested in this subject because. Okay. Uh, it's definitely something I uh, have been very interested in a long time. And when I found out about Cahokia and how much influence there was from Mexico, I thought, okay, there's, there's my next talk. <laughs> thank okay. you all so much. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.